Hi there, I'm Lisa Christensen, and I'm the next guest on Rob's Inner Circle. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. I mean it. Stay right where you are. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Robert Delessio, and I'm the host of Rob's Inner Circle, broadcasting live from Montreal. We have a great show lined up for you guys tonight, so don't go anywhere. Just like Lisa just said, stay right where you are. We'll be right back. I wanted to give a huge shout out to the producer of Rob's Inner Circle, Jenny Duhame, and to the podcast techie, Patty, Lady Starlight Saragossa. Wishing all of our Asian friends, our Asian family community, a Sin Yen Kwai La. Gong Hai Fat Choi. How's that for my Chinese? Look at a round of applause. Just letting you know that I am wearing my lucky red underwears. And that's exactly for that reason there. It's because it's going to bring me a lot of luck on the show. Uh, the picture you see here, well, that's our producer, Jenny Duhame, with her mentor and good friend, Aurora Liang, from Tres Out de Chien, au Canada. Well, they performed the song Sell Water last night in the Chinese New Year Gala, organized by the Montreal Chinese Association. And you can now see on YouTube at the 1 hour 35 second mark. So you want to check out the link that's on your screen right now to go see these amazing performers. Be sure to watch Daily Struggles. That's a sitcom everyone is talking about on the Rise Up TV channel on the Roku streaming service. Download the Roku app on your smart devices or get the Roku stick at Amazon for as little as $30. Make sure you watch all of our productions on the Bobby Short Shorts YouTube channel. Comment, share, Click on the like button, subscribe to Bobby Short Shorts, and most of all, you want to hit that notification bell because anytime a new production comes out, you'll be the first to know. All of the Rob's Inner Circle merchandise is available at 514brandingco.com. We have amazing t-shirts, mugs, cups, Comforters, pillows, you name it. That's all at 514brandingco.com. Well, folks, it's that time once again. It's the time to slip into our weekly ritual. This is the moment that we sit back, relax, kick up our feet on the edge of the table, and take a deep breath, exhale, and let us carry the load. Folks! It's showtime. It is time to bring on our guest this evening. You hear her every Saturday morning on the radio. She's got her amazing show. She's on New Stock Radio, Montreal, CJAD 800. She's the host of the car show and also a city councillor in the Valerie Plot administration. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome tonight's star attraction on Rob's Inner Circle. Lisa Christensen. Lisa, good evening. Hey, how are you? Great. We have uh, a lag in the sound that's new. It sounds like you are really speaking in a tunnel and really, really slowly. So I'm, I'm not sure if you can hear me okay, but your signal, I'm not hearing you all of a sudden. I hear you very well, Lisa. I hope it's not going to be an issue for you. You're, you're, you're extremely slow. I okay. can't make out what you're saying. I'm sorry. Okay, so Lisa, this is what we're going to try. You can come into the studio. Uh, let's say you log out and come back in, and that could probably resolve the issue. You want to try that? Okay, so I think what I better do is disconnect and reconnect. Is that yes. what you want me to do? Okay. Yes, yes. Because that's just suddenly changed. Oh, God. Okay, don't worry about it. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're experiencing a little technical difficulty. Lisa has logged out. 
and she's going to be coming back in. Sorry for the inconvenience. So Elisa is uh, our guest tonight. She is the host of uh, the car show on CJD every Saturday morning. She's been on the show for quite a while. She's a female mechanic, top-notch female mechanic. For those of you who don't know who Lisa is, uh, here she is back. There you are. You sound so much better now. Oh, well, okay. See, you know, I was sick and I got so much better. Wow, that chicken soup, huh? The best thing, a little motor oil on top, and you're doing great. <laughs> uh, synthetic while we're at it. It sounds like a little bit of motor oil on your, your chicken soup helped the whole show go. <laughs> Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. Such an honor. Um, I've been a fan of yours for many, many years. I remember in the days uh, when I was a bus driver for, on the South Shore uh, Transit System, you were, I was always tuned into you every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. Is that your regular time these days? Yeah, it's, uh, it's been the regular time slot since actually since day one when I stepped into the studio almost 29 years ago. Oh, my God. So I've been very fortunate. I've had an, a great run so far. And um, 10 o'clock, yep, every Saturday morning. <laughs> so let's let's get to find out a little bit uh, about you, Lisa. We're going to get into the, uh, the subject of radio. What is it that sparked you to go into car repair in the first place? Actually, it was a dare. Really, it was a dare because there's nobody in my family that has a mechanical background. Um, I mean, handy, I suppose, but not, nobody was in the trades at all. So I, I guess it was um, grade eight, secondary two high school, where you get to choose your electives for the next couple of years. I um, was sitting with my friends and the boys said, uh, well, we're going to go take shop. You girls go take hairdressing. And I'm like, <laughs> why? Well, because you're a girl. I'm like, so, and uh, I, I just said, you know what, it's an elective. I, I hopped on, I grabbed five girlfriends and all six girls, we, we joined Auto Shop that year, but it was a theory course, but it's the theory course that I got hooked on. I got hooked on the science between, you know, like the propulsion. How does, how does a, a, a ship on, on the, on the St. St. Lawrence, how does it stay afloat? It's, it's a big, heavy piece of steel. How does a plane fly? How does a car move? <laughs> so once I, I, I understood that it, on the theory course, I was like, wow, this is really interesting. I think I'm going to do this again. So as time went on, you, dis you discovered that you were developing uh, quite a bit of a passion for this trade, which back in the day was not exactly common for a woman. No, absolutely. It was it's what they could definitely called a non-traditional field. Uh, my parents weren't very impressed with my choice. Uh, it was really tough going when I got out of school with my apprentice card. I went to work for a really, really small garage. Um, not, not the best place for a young lady to work. Um, it, took, it took me about three years before I, I learned that I had a voice and how to go out about expressing myself and stop taking all that, all the garbage that was raining down on me. So, you were studying in school and yeah. your male your male peers weren't exactly receptive towards you no you know what we were still back in in my time you did things through high school and you did it a long vocational over a three-year period whereas today you have to complete your high school education and then go back as an adult education so it, it's a little bit different because we were all friends graduating you know in 1988 I'm going to date myself severely now um, <laughs> it wasn't so bad it was really once I got into the workplace where things were really crazy so you were even met uh, with resistance from your own teacher you were telling me when we had our pre-interview that your teacher said uh, no no you shouldn't be here you should be like in the typing class and home economics he thought yeah. you didn't belong there well, it's because my parents had called the school when they when they understood that I was going to take this as a career and told the, the principal that, you know, we don't want her in automobile mechanics, put her in business courses, secretarial studies. And I, I remember going to that door because I was being forced to do this and opening the door and looking at everybody in there. And back, we're going back again with a typing. We go tick, 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 tick. <laughs> I took one look and I said, this is really not for me. So I went back to the automobile mechanics class and the teacher came up. I just picked up some stuff and started doing stuff. And he said, you know, you're not supposed to be here. And I said, well, sir, you have a choice. You can either um, be responsible for me dropping out of high school or 
you can leave me here and teach me a trade that I'm really interested in. So he's like, what am I going to do? She wants to be here. Her parents will have to understand. So gender equality has gone a really long way. For example, my daughter is one of the only female aircraft technicians at Bombardier. And we also had a guest not long ago on our show who's on episode 56, Kathy Mulroy. She was a pioneer in the mining industry in Sudbury, Ontario. If you go back like not long ago, it's unbelievable that women were just not perceived as part of the workforce for some reason, especially whether it's fireman, bus driver, um, mechanic. Yep. What is it that sparked that change all of a sudden uh, for women to become more equal in society? Well, I don't know about all the other trades, but I know in the automotive industry, you know, we had to do at one time, we didn't have, I mean, yeah, we had CSST, but we didn't have all the, the lifting tools and we weren't, you have to do this by, by CSST rules. You had to work, it was physical labor. I can tell, you know, many stories about uh, having to remove an engine and all I had is what we call, it's an engine lift, we called it the cherry picker. Uh, and um, maybe a pole with grease on it and some chains. And you had to, blocks of wood, and you had to heft that thing out of there. I mean, it was just, it was over years of having to build muscle and then build this to, to do those jobs. Whereas today, you still need this, but you have a lot more um, accessibility to a jack for this, a hoist for that. Um, it's not the same not the same thing. It's, it's a little bit, I won't say easier because technology again is everything, but physical labor, there's so many rules that have been put in place and so many more new tools that have developed. So it, it helps take the physical strain off your body. Well, what I find really cute, <laughs> you were saying um, that one of your first jobs, your boss actually painted your lift pink. <laughs> yes, he did. He painted my lift pink. After, um, I think I was there six months, but an even funnier story, which I didn't tell you in the pre-interview, was that is where I met my now husband, is at that first garage where I worked at. And one of the stories we like to tell everybody is that I gave birth to a 318 because uh. we worked side by side on a job on a um, kosher bakery um, Chrysler van, and we had to change the engine. And that garage was so small, you didn't have enough room to put the tools in and not... So what we ended up having to do is literally uh, insert a pole down the tunnel ram of the truck, take off the bumper and uh, get the engine on the jack. And I had to literally be inside with my two feet like, like that against the engine. <laughs> oh and God. I had to push like I was pushing out a baby oh. so that he could pull from the other side. And then someone would, was, we were pushing the van at the same time so we could get that engine out. So that's, a, that's an old joke we like to say about how I gave birth with 318. <laughs> <laughs> so, once you graduated, you go into the workforce. Yeah. It was one thing when you were at school. Now you're in the workforce all of a sudden. How were you perceived by your male colleagues? Oh, I mean, I worked at some of the worst places you could ever imagine. Um, you know, and for the first three years, I worked in places where sexual harassment, uh, verbal abuse, um physical abuse I, I i've been you know in the very beginning because you know i've been in this business 35 years you know it's just a kid out of high school um i was 18 19 years old and i was spit on i was uh, shoved into brick walls i was groped i had all, all kinds of horrible things that happened it took me like i said three years and then i i sort of got my voice and started you know to say that i have knowledge in this business I'm not here for just somebody else to to pick on and I started to study really really hard to perfect my trade and once I guess you could say colleagues started seeing that I'm not just a bit of fluff uh, I'm really there to work I'm really interested in the work the respect comes but it's for sure back then as a woman you had to work twice as hard and be twice as good to be just considered equal which is great i'm really happy to hear and, and see from a lot of women in, in different trades that that's changed quite a bit nowadays so i'm really happy that that and the fact you can get women's work clothes what it's a, it's a marvel but you had a hard time adapting because there weren't any women's work clothes back in the day so how, how did you work get by clothes? 
no women's work clothes, no uh, women's work shoes. Um, I wore men's Kodiak boots with extra <laughs> pairs of socks. Oh, wow. I um, had I had my uniforms. The shirts were okay because they were ex too big. So, you know, because my shoulders and my waist and everything else in between um, didn't fit in the regular shirt. So I had to wear a men's shirt that was bigger. And I usually had to pin where the last button was because obviously it didn't fit right. The pants, I had them custom made by a seamster who, um, who, who, who literally made my own work pants with pockets the way I wanted and everything. I still kept a pair of those as a souvenir. Man, that's quite a while back. Very while back. So tell us, how were the customers perceiving you? Because, you know, like we said at the beginning, it's not a, a traditional thing seeing a woman mechanic. Nope. So now all of a exactly. sudden you're in a garage and customers come in and they see you. You're going to be working on the car. What was their perception? Well, usually I, I didn't have much trouble. I, although I do I remember one occasion where I was working at a big box chain store and um, a lady, an older lady, working on her car and she went to the man next to me and she said, is she able to work on my car? Oh, wow. Because it's non-traditional, right? So, so yeah, I fixed it. I always had a, a, um, a taste for perfection, for like go further than. So I always looked for training, regardless of the training. I, I wanted to take this. I took that. I took the electrical. I don't know how many times. I took a Ford Power Stroke diesel course from a friend of mine. It was given in French. I took this course because it was so fascinating, that engine. It was a 7.3 Power Stroke Ford diesel engine. I took it 13 times because what's interesting, if anybody's ever taken any kind of training course, if you've taken the same course more than once, it's the people bringing in to the course that bring a different flavor, different questions. So there's different answers. So you have the course material, but the experience about other questions coming in made it fantastic. So... I learned more from, of course, the people in the courses than the actual material because I knew the material. But um, training has always been my passion. So what do you specialize in? Are you specialized in transmissions, brakes? Is there any kind of field that you're really specialized in? Yeah, I, I'd say that I'm what they call me is a diagnostic specialist. I, I deal in electrical and uh, fuel injection diagnosing. That's really my specialty. In the beginning, because honesty, and you know, uh, honesty is the best way to go, but sometimes it just doesn't fit in where the boss has got a vision on making yeah. money. And you've worked mm -hmm. at a few places that you were saying that the boss wanted you to change parts that were not necessary to change. And oh, yeah. you, of course, were very, uh, you, were, you weren't going for that. So tell us how it is that you coped in a situation like that. Well, that goes back. Uh quite a few years now probably a good 20 25 years ago but but it's funny i can remember the uh, a 15 millimeter socket an extension i lost on a car i can remember that the only tool i ever lost on a car i can remember having that vehicle that came in for a scope and spark plug package uh, on an eight-cylinder engine and i can remember very clearly looking at the spark plugs and seeing they were brand new i mean like look like came out of the box and installed on the car yesterday brand new so I was very happy. I said, hey, great. This is, went to my, my foreman and I said, this is good news for the customer. Instead of spending $90, you only have to spend $40 and we'll do the scope test and it'll be great. Put the spark plugs in. And I said, no, I'm not going to put the spark plugs in. He goes, put the spark plugs in. And I said, he doesn't need the spark plugs. So the, the, the war was on. And what, what happened is the top troubleshooter, said you don't want to put the spark plugs in and I said I'm not putting the spark plugs I am not putting spark plugs in a car that doesn't require them so they said okay so they took me off of the diagnostic and troubleshooting they put me on transmissions and clutches for a week and the transmission jack was broken oh so I had to do the clutches and transmissions on my shoulder using the lift using you know a, a table to hold it and crouching down to get bolts on and they put me on that for a week and then they came back to me and said are you ready to do tune-ups now and I said, you better transfer me or you're going to have problems, buddy. But uh, they didn't break <laughs> They didn't break me because I refused to put parts in. And, and that's something I talk about on the radio show a lot. I hate changing parts for nothing. There are occasions where, the, you know, all your testing has led you there. and You have no choice. You have to change the part to go to the next step. But I'll usually hang on to the part. 
because I want to see the parts defective. I want to prove it's defective so that I can comfortably say to the customer, the part's defective. I tested it like this. It showed me it's defective. You got a good repair. Folks, don't be shy. You're a little quiet tonight. I know you're late to ask questions. This is the perfect time. Lisa, our guest, is used to asking questions. That's what she does on Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock on The Car Show. So, folks, any questions you have, feel free to ask our guest, Lisa Christensen. Lisa, so glad to have you on the show. This is exciting. Thank you. We have a good That's participation fun. tonight. Yeah, great. Excellent. How many people? Where are all these people? Why aren't they asking you questions? I understand people always ask questions. To well, you. you know what, Lisa? I have a funny feeling we have just aw awakened something. I, I just have a feeling a question or two is going to pop up. It's coming. Oh. It's around the corner. I see that crystal ball. It sounds good. <laughs> well, you know what? I'll tell you something. At this time of the year, a lot of people don't realize that um, it's the time of the year where you really have to watch your car. Uh, things you know go crazy right now you know what goes crazy things like uh blowing headlights things like uh wipers seizing up and not moving um yeah we could you know it's easy to talk about a battery that goes defective but there's other things too you know people have car mats that freeze in place because they get full of water then they get out of the car and it freezes so what happens the next day you get in maybe your gas pedals jam because you've got a nice frozen car mat under there simple things that can be checked and cost you nothing to do and how many times have you seen wiper linkages that broke because a lot of people what they do it's probably snowing it's raining or a sleet wet snow they turn off the car and the wipers are not off so in the, in the middle of the night there's a big snowstorm there's about four inches of snow on your windshield mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you start the car what happens eh the linkage forces and it breaks. So have you seen that a lot in the winter time? What we see in the winter, when it comes to wipers, a lot of people don't clean off their cars properly or they don't clean the ice out from around the wipers where they go down inside the car. They leave that full of slush. Uh, you know, it, it, it just, it freezes like cement. So if you're a person that's, you know, you're, you're on your way home, you've got the wipers going and, you know, you get home and they just happen to be down when you get home and you turn off exactly. your car fast, uh -huh. you've forgotten that they're on. And so the next thing morning when you get on, you turn the car on, first thing the wipers want to do is move four to six inches of snow and ice off the windshield. And today's linkages are not like, you know, 30 years ago. They're, they're tin, they're plastic grommets. Um, they can't handle the load. You blow the fuse if you're lucky. And if you're not lucky, you break the linkage. So... Oof. What are your tips? You know that tomorrow morning is going to be minus 28 with the wind factor and all. What are oh. tips so that you know your car is going to start in the morning? Is it a good idea to shut off your wipers, your radio, your heater, any electrical thing? Because when you're starting up the car, does that use up a lot of the battery? Well, it, as soon as you, you push a button on, or if you still have a key, you turn the key on, you want yeah, the electrons are, are racing in the battery. So if you've gone and left a ton of stuff on, maybe your battery is a little bit weak, you're just adding to that drain. So you know what I always tell people the best case, you know, because you, you got the rear defogger on on the way home, maybe you've got the, the blower on full blast to keep the window defrosted from icing up, your wipers are on, your headlights are on, you've got heated seats maybe, is two blocks from your house, power down two, three blocks in your house, just power everything down. Turn off the rear defogger. You don't need to know what's behind you. You're going forward. Turn off your heated seats. Um, you know, lower the speed on the blower motor. You're two blocks from home. And give the battery and the alternate. The, the alternate has to constantly fill up the battery. Give the, that alternator a chance to fill the battery up, and you'll have a better opportunity of starting the next day. You know, we can't make miracles. If your battery is no good and you're sort of waiting to change it, you can't ask it to do more than it's, it's capable to do. So power down before you get home, and that will increase your chances of a good startup the next day. Well, Lisa, here's our first question. Our good friend, uh, Norman Zimmerman from Steve's Music, who was on our show. And uh, I, I believe he's a fan of yours because he's got a really smart question over here. He goes, Lisa, what are, what are your thoughts on the rotary engine? That's probably, he's probably referring to a Mazda RX-8. A very, uh, uh, yeah, an older, maybe an older one as well. Uh, you know what? Hmm. Hmm. Not really a big <laughs> fan. Hmm. Sorry, not a really big fan. 
um, I, I don't know how to say, you know, everybody has their specialty. I never, ever liked that um, Mazda rotary engine from, from day one. I can remember never. I'm sorry, but it's not my favorite engine. Okay, so can you explain to us what a rotary engine is? Because apparently these engines are very delicate. Oh, I don't know if they're delicate. In fact, I think it's the opposite. I think they're quite strong. So yeah, they, it's just it's just like that. I mean, just imagine that turning in a round circle with little teeth in it. it, it if you if you wanted to put check the RPM on one of those, it would it would say at idle, which was normally about you know five to seven hundred RPM. A rotary engine, it's turning at like three to five thousand RPM, and you're like, what? You know, but it's not the same thing. So, I think it'll be um, really hard for people to understand a rotary engine. Your daughter would understand because of what work she does. But um, most people aren't going to understand that. So, you know, it's make it easy. Stick to the old cylinders. <laughs> well, we have a recommendation here from a great fan of yours, Fernando Renzo, who's joined us. Thank you, Fernando. And his tip is to turn the key on and wait for a few seconds before cranking. This allows the fuel pressure to pick up from the electric pump. This is time to make a friend, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? This will work if your car still has a key. Um, but if you turn the key on, I always say if you have a key, turn the key on and count 1001, 1002, 1003, and then start your car. It, yes, it's called a fuel pump prime that Fernando's call, uh, speaking about. It's called a fuel pump prime. You're priming the engine. Um, but if your, your fuel pump is running right, you shouldn't have a problem with starting the car. So it's only if you're having a long extended cranking period in the morning. Where it, we used to say with the Chrysler, it used to go ata 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 <laughs> So <laughs> it's the same thing. So if you have a long extended cranking on your car, it may be that fuel is draining back into the tank, and that's why you would have to turn the key on off a couple of times or key key on and uh, prime it once or twice to get the car going. These rotary engines take uh, tend to burn oil a lot quite possible i don't work on too many of them but you know what uh, any engine can burn oil you know that's a higher it's a different um ratio of spinning on the rotary engine it, it's not the same as a car that's why mazda's rotary engine is kind of in a class by itself okay why you know we know that a cylinder engine works well why come up with a rotary engine what's what's the whole idea what's the whole concept is it because it's faster don't know no don't know i can't answer that question <laughs> okay so your philosophy is treating every car's every customer's car as if it were yours and that's what's become your trademark yes we is. recognize the honesty in you every time that you're on the radio and we get the feeling that you really do care about the customer I absolutely do. And I always say, um, especially on the radio, look, I'm on the radio. I don't see the car. I don't touch the car. I'm only hearing one side of the, of the, of the problem from the, city, from the person. So I have to like put my, my hat on and think about it the way they're explaining it. Obviously, I can't fix a car on the radio. But what I try to do is envision the problem and then explain what could be the, the, the problem with the car to try and educate the person so they can go back to the mechanic and say, Hey, have you thought about this? Um, do, can it, could it be this? And the reason is the difference for me uh, in the radio station versus me in a garage situation is that when I'm in the garage, the phone is ringing, parts are coming in, customers waiting for the car. Then other cars come early for the appointment. You have so much going on around you. Whereas the fun part of a radio is I get to sit there, <laughs> listen to what's going on with the problem. And I can just, zen out and and you know i can just think about what the problem is because people also think that i have a shop manual or i'm I, i'm flipping through this you don't have time as, as you know robert you don't have time to say okay hold on let me get a book out here and let me no it's live. Like 60 seconds it's live go 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 <laughs> and i will i don't lie to people i've made it a um my, my trait over the years is if i don't know i say it and i tell people and i don't say hey you know this product uh it's a great product try it unless I've tried it. Uh, over the years, I've had people bring me all kinds of products and say, hey, try this out and tell me what you think. It's a great product. I take it and I give it to, to someone in my family or a neighbor or a friend. And I say, try this out. And tell me what you think. And I'll try it out. I don't want to hear two or three opinions of a product or a test or, or a tip. 
before I pass it along. Because I like to tell people, I've tried this. It works. Or I've tried this. It does work. And I also tell people to send me products. If it's no good, I'm going to tell people it's no good. Because you have to be honest. People will pay anything to fix their cars. Fix it right the first time. Be honest with them. Fernando just made a comment. Patty, I don't know if we can get that comment back on here. It's something about the new rotary engines. There you go. There's a new design rotary engine that is an experimentation that will overcome the old problems. Good. <laughs> Less moving parts, as Fernando would say. <laughs> so people, um, like you said, you know, it's better going to a mechanic who's going to charge you maybe $100, $150 an hour but he's going to get it right maybe within an hour. Yeah, when that's you go, it. When you, you know, when you go to the a makeshift mechanic that could be your neighbor, ah, give me 20 bucks an hour. The guy's been playing on your car for 10 hours. It still didn't find the problem. And when he's connecting those wires, he puts masking tape on it instead of oh, putting the gosh. right connectors. Oh, okay, oh God, so you know what? Nightmare. <laughs> so talk, talk to us about doing jobs, homemade jobs, putting wires together with masking tape. So tell us about that. Uh, you know... I, I, like I said, I try and give people ideas to do it themselves to a certain degree. I don't want people messing around with their brakes at home. I want to tell you how the braking system works, how your mechanic will go about changing the brakes or machining discs or lubricating calipers, but I don't want people to touch this stuff at home. So when it comes to electrical on your car, even boosting a car, my daughter is a great example because she was in the car with me and we were just about home. And there was a car stalled in the middle of uh, the road, uh, three lanes in the intersection. And another car, I guess he called a friend, was there to boost him. And as I'm coming up, you know, I, I saw right away. I said, I'm going to watch this. He's going to blow the car up. The car is going to blow. So as soon as he connected the, 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 um, the booster cables, you saw a flash. All of a sudden, that car didn't start. So okay. Two cars blocked. Because he was, he boosted the car. And the other car was running. You never, please, people. If you learn one thing tonight, you do not boost the car with an engine running. Okay, you are looking for trouble. And this guy blew the main fuse on the car. And then I, I called, I called nine one one. I said, listen, we have an issue in the intersection here. Now you, the guy came to boost. He blew his car. So now you have two cars stuck in the intersection where buses and school buses are, as well as come and tow them out of there. I said, here comes a third car ready to get involved and get in the same problem. So you have to be careful. You have to, you, your owner's manual, it's there for a reason. It has such good information <laughs> for you in there. Folks, uh, this, we're having a great show tonight. Lisa is, a, is a, a well of knowledge and she can answer your questions. She used to answering your questions every Saturday morning. So get your questions ready. Go ahead and ask Lisa some questions. She'll be more than happy to oblige. The practice of, you know, your brakes are a little worn to get that rust on it. Do yeah. people, do garages still actually turn the discs? Yeah, you know what? There are still places that will machine a disc. Um, but today, the, the thickness of the discs are what we call discard or knockoff right away. You have a number, a specification on the disc. That you can measure when it's new. And then there's usually a second what's discard. But by the time your, your, new, your brake pads wear with the disc, you are so close to discard that if you machine it, you either add the number of discard or you've already gone past that. Now, what happens is as you remove the material um, on, the, on the machine disc, you're, you're scraping, you're machining that off, you're making it thinner. And as it gets thinner, what's going to happen is it's going to get hot faster. If it gets hot faster than it wears your brakes quicker so it's a kind of a catch-22 what we look at now and again most car companies is the same way is new brake pads new brake discs clean the surfaces lubricate the uh, calipers make sure that they're free and really important is to clean all the mounting surfaces i used to take a file and clean the saddle for the calipers and then put the proper brake lubricants in there you can't just put any old stuff because it's brakes you, you can't put grease in there because you're going to contaminate your brakes, and you're going to be not having a good braking system. So proper components, proper area, but a good functioning caliper really is a good key to keeping the brakes going longer. And if a car sits in the driveway, uh, Robert, and it's not moving, 
community after a rainstorm, people that, that are watching right now will say, yeah, yeah, I know exactly what she's talking about. You back out of your driveway that day or after the, the rainstorm and your brakes grind for the first block because they get surface rust on them. And that just burns off to a mirror finish usually. But that's the rust you're talking about on the edges. But there's also the fact if, uh, I'll give you an example, um, people who go to the Dominican Republic for three months, the car has been sitting there for three yep. months. Mm -hmm. When they come back, what can they expect? You know, it all depends where the car is parked. If the car is parked outside and, you know, you get a lot of rain and this and that, uh, heat, cold, whatever, then rust will form. If the car is parked inside, another thing people don't realize is that when you park a car inside, if the car inside has a drain and it's sitting over that drain and there's water in that drain, that's moisture. So a car that's parked six months in the garage can still have rust. That's why we tell people, old days, oh, jack up the car and let the suspension hang. No, are you kidding me? You're leaving all that, that stainless steel, beautiful metal, shiny, with a little bit of, it's gonna rust, it's gonna picate, it's gonna be, no, let a car sit. And um, it, you know, hopefully when you come back, you point, you always, word of thought, point your car as if you're driving out of a garage. That way, if the car doesn't start or it needs to be towed, it's accessible for a tow truck to get in there. So usually if you park your car for three, four months, you shouldn't have a problem. You might get that little brake grind, little squeal, little grind. But after you go a couple of blocks, you heat up the brakes, you should be just fine. For working at a dealership, I know we have many cars and some of them are stopped for four months. And what happens, the customers go for a test drive when they go hit the brakes. Yeah. So what's that all about? <laughs> well, that, that usually is because somebody's been test driving that car really hard and hitting the brakes and overheating the discs. They usually won't give you one from the yard because those are all vehicles that are waiting, uh, either ordered or to be sold. They usually have a loan, uh, a car that's a demo car to, to take people out and let them try. So if, it, it's, it's in their best interest always to make sure that that demo car is really working the way it's supposed to and all the accessories are working because if you get in that car, and as an example, you turn the corner, you hear a clack, clack, clack sound, or you're, you're pushing on the brake and it's grinding or chirping or squealing. It's going to be like, oh, do I really want to buy a car like this? Is, is this car <laughs> new and it's making all these noises? So no, the dealers will always make sure that that car that they take you for a ride in is in really good shape. Let's talk about tire pressure, how important it is to have the right tire pressure in the car. Because when the car, uh, the, the tires are low, Yep. That's not necessarily good. So what's happening besides the gas consumption? Well, I taught my kids that when they were five years old, how to use a tire pressure gauge. My daughter first, then my son. Because tire pressure really is um, so important to the lifespan of your tires. Yes, balancing. Yes, alignment. But tire pressure is an example. Um, if you're too low, you're going to wear the side of the tire. So if you imagine the tread like this, you're going to wear out this part and this part of the tread. If you overinflate the tire, bad handling in both cases, um, vibration in both cases, um, fuel consumption if it's too low. If it's running too high, you wear out the center of the tire and tires are expensive. So to just learn how to do your tire pressure properly will save you money in the long run. Proper inflated tires means the car goes, rolls easier, um, has better handling. Uh, I've had tires that have had so much air pressure that I remember taking the tire off and we used to take the tire off and you sort of kind of like drop it so that it bounces. It made this ping sound. It was, it was literally the sound waves inside the overinflated tire that were, were banging against each other. And that was that ping sound in the tire. And the, cu the customer was complaining of a very harsh suspension. And they felt like they were bouncing everywhere. Well, the tires were so overinflated. It was, it was ridiculous. But just a simple thing like tire pressure can save you tons of money. So what would be the average tire pressure to put inside a tire? And that all depends on the car company. So for people that are watching at home, the best thing to do is go to your car. And then you could say, okay, if I open the driver's door, there should be a little, almost like a credit card, a metal tag. And it'll tell you, or a sticker that'll say front and rear. It'll give you a tire size, usually two tire sizes, one for winter, one for summer. And it'll also give you the tire pressures. So that's the tire pressure you want. You know, like the, some of the Hondas used to have 26 in the front, 28 in the back. The old cars used to be 32 all year round, all, all, all wheels around. Now you can have 30, 31, 
you know, 30 pounds of pressure, you can't really go wrong. So if you if you get stuck and you're not sure what your tire pressure is, a good quality tire pressure gauge. Don't go for something plastic and Mickey Mouse, okay? <laughs> and we have a question from our good friend, Fernando. He's asking, what is one of the old cars you held on to and why? Um... Well, the, the cute story is the first place I worked, I was uh, 17 when I started working Saturdays. They taught me how to drive this beat up old tow truck that they had. And I would go and do local towings of uh, the vehicles and bring them into the shop. And one day the boss said to me, you know, I think you should get your driver's license because I, was, I didn't have a driver's license. I live right next to public transportation, so I didn't need a driver's license. He says, because you're a pretty young girl. He says, eventually a police officer is going to stop you. And if they check your license, <laughs> I'm in trouble. So this is the same guy who, after I got my driver's license, said, you know what? You need a car. I said, I don't need a car. He says, you need a car. So he gave me an old car that was at the shop. It was a 74 Dodge Dart. Oh. Then they couldn't find me because I was always in the car driving somewhere. <laughs> I slept in the car. I ate in the car. I would go for trips and, and come back. Like I'd go overnight. I'd, I'd stop somewhere, somewhere on the road and just... Because the seat in the front completely fell over, so I could I could sleep in the back and in the like you know in an L shape, and it had little pop out vent windows, so I could lock the doors and open the vents and breathe properly. So my '74 Dodge Dart was my first car that I absolutely love. It was a Slant Six, which is indestructible. And then after that, I you know I had a couple other cars, but then my next old car was a '73 Ford Gran Torino with a 351 Windsor, which is a two barrel carburetor, a detuned, oh, nice. you know, 350. Yeah, not really, it's detuned. But what's great about it is it was 17 and a half feet long. And oh. I swear that the nose <laughs> had to be 15 feet long. <laughs> it was just, you were sitting in the cockpit of an airplane when you put, the, it was a two door, you put the, the two door windows down and the back had little tiny vent windows that actually backed up into the body. They didn't go down. They went back with a little tiny window crack. So when you had them both done and you sat in that seat, <laughs> it felt like you were in the cockpit of an airplane. It was so big, this car. Man, did that car drink gas. A 1968 Ford Mustang with a 289 engine, Camaro SS69, and a 1970 Dodge Challenger. What do you think? Would, would that be a collection you'd like to own? I'm more of a, you know, of course, who doesn't like a good road runner? I mean, I'm, oh, I'm yeah. old car, old school. So, you know, I like a Nova SS. Um, I love a Barracuda. I love, a, you know, a road runner, a Super B, you know, those are, those are old cars. Today, you, 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 I wouldn't get into a Chrysler. You can't get me into those RT or something. That's not my style. I, I like the old cars. The old cars had character. When you looked if you ask anybody over the age of 50, when they can remember looking down the road on the highway, you would see a car coming at you with the headlights. You knew exactly what car it was yes. and you knew what year it was because of the headlights were shaped like this. The bumper was shaped like this. Even at night, you could tell what kind of car was coming at you. Today, <laughs> they all look the same. It was so much easier back in the day. I don't know anything about mechanics, but you give me an old car like a 1971 uh, Plymouth Barracuda, I could probably take that engine apart, but right now with all of the electronics inside the engines, and you look at the car in an awkward way, and the check engine light is going to come on. So Absolutely. How, how much has technology you know, improved or not exactly improved? Well, you know, I guess it depends on how you look at it. Old cars have their you know, if we wouldn't have to worry about an environment or climate change or, or fossil fuels, our old cars definitely have their charm because, you know, old cars, old way of thinking, slow down, cruise. I mean, if you get someone with an, I mean, my husband's favorite car is a 57, 57 Chevy Bel Air. <laughs> Not go. my favorite. Not my favorite. No. But if you put someone behind the wheel of that car, they're not speeding. They're cruising. They're taking it easy. It's a Sunday afternoon drive. And that's what's changed with cars over the years is that when we got away from the, like the sporty or the muscle car and we started getting, you know, you know, 86 Chevrolet with a, with a V6 fuel injected, multi-port fuel injected car, you, you started, you know, people just change the way they drive. There's more cars on the road. People are always in a rush. 
you see an old car today, a classic car on the road, they're not rushing. They're taking their time. They're, they're chill. They're so that's what's changed a lot for me when it, when it comes to the cars. Everybody's in a big rush. Everybody wants to get there yesterday. Um, cars have to perform, and they have to perform with lighter weight materials. They have to perform with tighter restrictions as far as um, oil is concerned, coolant is concerned. You know, coolant we used to change. Tune-ups in the old days, tune-ups were a cap rotor wire point, spark plugs, gas filter, air filter, two or three times a year. Whereas today, you've got long life antifreeze that goes 10 years in a lot of car companies. You've got spark plugs that they claim go 160,000 kilometers. I wouldn't wow. want to take them out because they're going to be fused to the engine, but, <laughs> you know, uh, they claim that. And then fuel filters, well, there's a lot of cars don't have a fuel filter per se that's changeable. It's in the fuel tank, part of the fuel filter, uh, the fuel pump system. So you, you don't have those things. Now it's cabin filters, scan tests, air filter. And that's about it. Oil changes, even oil changes. Cars have algorithms now to, to, to <laughs> analyze how yeah. many RPMs of the engine versus how much time versus what's the temperature in your atmosphere. And then they calculate that and say, oh, it's time to change your oil. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Where in the old days, you know, look, you have to put five quarts in an engine. Let's go, right? And you do that four times a year. So you're the host of a very popular radio show every Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock. How did that come about? How did you end up going into radio? That was an accident. Um, I was doing car courses for women through the downtown Women's Y uh, on Rene Levesque. And um, CBC Morning Show um, was actually looking for someone to talk about winter motor oil and summer motor oil. So they called, the, they knew about the Women's Handy Woman program, and they called, and they, someone had suggested uh, get in touch with me because I had a, an apprentice card at the time. I was an apprentice. And um, they asked me to, if I would come on and talk about motor oil. So I went in person. Doing the call in, I said, it's better to always be in person. And um, back then, uh, um, a very nice man named Ted Blackman was coming from Hudson. He was driving in like he did every morning, and part of his job as program director back then was to flip the dials and see what other people are talking about. And I know the story because I know the person that he actually called now at the radio station, but I did my three minute bit and then he heard it. He called CJD's newsroom and he said, there's some chick talking cars on CBC <laughs> finder. So and I know the story is true because I know the person he actually spoke to. So and he was the sweetest guy and he called me up. And he said, I'd, I'd like to talk to you. I'd like to come and see you. And I'd like to see, uh, you know, get you to come on and talk to our CJD listeners about cars. So I said, yeah, sure. Sounds like fun. He says, but I want to talk to your father first. I'm like, what? I'm 24 years, 24. You want to talk to my dad? He says, yes, I want your father's permission. I want to make sure that he understands this is on the up and up. And there's not, no funny business here. Because that just shows you the gentleman that Ted Blackman was old school. So my dad called me up. He said, I've been with my dad in years. And he said, uh, I got the strangest call from Ted Blackman. My father was a big CJD listener, so we knew exactly who it was. So he gave Ted his permission <laughs> <laughs> to let me come on the show. And I That's guess they cool. say the rest is history. I, I was on a, a, an afternoon show with jo, uh, Jim Duff with a few of the different experts. It was kind of like, the, it was kinda like a, a home improvement segment. So they had a rotation of five different experts every week and then every every two weeks every three weeks every and then eventually um i started doing friday nights with peter anthony holder and then uh, a new program director had come in and he said you know what you need to be on saturday mornings by yourself so they booted me off the air on friday night and then i, I like i came in to do the show with peter and he says what are you doing here you're not you're not doing the show i said what do you mean he goes no no go home they gave you your own show and i said what I didn't even know. And then I get a call saying, oh, yeah, can you come tomorrow morning at 10 a.m.? We're going to give you your own show. And I was like, I, I, I don't know how to do the board. I don't know how to do the push the buttons. He says, oh, we'll take care of that. So, of course, you know, over the years, I, I learned how to do all that stuff, you know. But um, it's just that the people at CJD, I have been so fortunate. I have been surrounded by such talented, such brilliant people that work at CJD from, from the on-air people to the program people behind the scenes, to the people that are behind the glass that make you sound good. I've been so fortunate to be working with these consummate professionals. It's time for some trivia. It's time to get the audience involved over here. We got 10 minutes left. Is there anyone out there who knows 
what CJAD stands for. I'll give you an example. CFCF would be Canada's finest, Canada's first. So CJAD has a, 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 what is it? it has a meaning. Does anyone out there know what it is? If you don't get it, we're going to have Lisa give you the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you remember, right, Lisa? Nope. <laughs> I hope nope. to God, because I'm pretty. I'm getting putting myself in the spot over here. <laughs> I don't remember. So you, you, but you know, I know you know. Oh, of course I know. Yeah, I did my there research. I did my homework. Yeah, there you go. There you and go. I'm, I'm a big CJD fan myself. I remember listening to George Balkan. Terry Demani yep. was on there for a while. Yeah. And yep. the trivia show every Sunday mornings. Yeah. I think if you're English and you lived in Montreal, you grew up with CJAD. You did. I, I, I can go back. I used to do car tips on, in, on TV as well because of the radio. I, I did car tips for CFCF 12 before CTV. And then uh, for Global, uh, Andrew Poplowski and I, we did car tips. Uh, we had, I, I, I really had a, a lot of fun. Uh, I did a, a commercial for the Ford Freestar out of Toronto. I've written two books. Uh, you know, I, I've had a really great and interesting career. I, I'm very fortunate because I always wanted to touch on all the aspects of the automotive industry. So, you know, I worked as a mechanic. Um, I worked as a teacher teaching the automotive industry program. I worked for a car parts company as a diagnostic specialist for their diagnostic hotline. I worked for autojobs.ca, which is a, a recruitment for the automobile industry. And, um, I also had the chance to, 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 you know, besides working for resource, I'm now back into the parity committee, which governs the automotive industry. And I get to work in some of my favorite stuff, which is training and qualification. I, I honestly believe in training and qualification. I have a class two. People think I'm a first class mate, and I'm not. I have a class two. Many years ago, I went for the exam. I wrote the exam and I missed first class by less than 3%. And I was thrilled. I'm a solid, you know, so I was happy about that. But um, back when I, when I was in this, like early, when we were talking earlier about how women in this industry, I was the only woman in Canada, master certified ASE. I was the only woman in Canada um, um, certified uh, with truck, heavy truck certifications because I didn't just do cars. I wanted to do diagnostic in heavy trucks. The, the Ford engine I was speaking about, it happened to come in, in larger vehicles as well. So I had a chance to, to do all those different trainings. I, I have a PEP certification for heavy duty trucks, which is a program en chrétien préventif. So I got, I've got to do a lot of interesting things. And, and, I, and I just always try to do more and learn more because if you know once you learn a system you don't care what the emblem is so if it's a five volt system on a ford it's a five volt system on a gm you know it's a five volt so it has a five volt signal it has a signal to turn it has a ground you don't have to look at the emblem think of the system so when you learn the systems of a car you can apply that to the next vehicle only chrysler chrysler makes trouble Chrysler went five volts to eight volts back to five volts because they realized their mistake. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't look as if anybody's about to answer the trivia question here. Maybe you, we should have you know. maybe we should have Dave Fisher and Jack Finnegan come back here and do the trivia That's show. True. Dave, Dave, uh, Dave Fisher would definitely know. actually you know what that would be good. Under, I bet you that question on the trivia show on Sunday morning would definitely be answered in three seconds flat. I guess people are just. Uh, enjoying themselves listening tonight. So is it uh, Dan Laxer who's doing uh, the trivia yep. show? Yep. Dan Laxer was also the ghost writer for my book. Oh. He, <laughs> ah, I dragged Dan Laxer <laughs> to every scrap yard. I dragged him under cars. <laughs> Uh, he just, he says, you know what, just here's a tape recorder, just talk. I'm just going to follow you around and talk. And I would show him parts and we would talk about things. We had such a great time. Well, folks, let's answer this question. Sonia Huggins is participating in the audience. She doesn't know. I don't think anybody knows. So it's time to answer the question. Well, folks, in the U.S., to give you an example, radio station starts with the letter K or W. Oh. Norm Zimmerman is very, very, very close. He almost got it. I, Norm, think, I, think, I think it's because he, he couldn't write the last few words. You know what, Norm? We're going to give you a chance to answer this. 
So we'll give you a double take on it. There you go. Oh. Congratulations, Norm Zimmern. <laughs> you got it. Yes. The letter C is for Canada. Every radio station has a letter C in front of it. And for your information, every airport has a letter C. It's a call letter because it's all to do with frequencies. In the United States, it's a K or a W, like the airport in Los Angeles would be KLAX, K-L-A-X. Congratulations, Norm, a job well done. Somebody Googled. Lisa, we don't have much time left over here. We didn't even have a chance to talk about your political career. Back in 2017, you became interested in politics. Something happened, something sparked that interest. What is it that happened that brought you into politics? Um, lighting up the Jacques Cartier Bridge and dumping oh. 8 billion liters of raw sewage into the St. Lawrence River. Our family loves to camp, loves to go fishing. Um, I just couldn't fathom where our tax dollars were going. I just, I just, I couldn't do it. So I said, you know what, you have a choice. You can stay home and scream at your TV or scream at the radio or read the newspaper, crumple it up. Or you can say, I want to make change. So I got a call and I said, you know what? I'm interested. I'm in, I'm going to run. And my goal would be to make positive change where um, I live, where my children were born, where they go to school. Uh, that's what I wanted to do. And I was very fortunate. People saw the genuine, I guess, in me and voted for me. And here I, I was for four years ago, um, borough councillor at that time for the Rivier de Prairie Pointe aux district in the district La Pointe aux Prairies. And then this past November, I ran again for a second term and I um, decided to run for a city council position, which the population was uh, very kind enough to have confidence in me and voted me in for a second mandate. Just before we go on and forget, you mentioned something about books. What are the books you've written? Well, Clueless About Cars. It's and called Clueless About Cars. And there's a, and a second version after that. The first version has my face on it. The second version is a stock photo, which I wasn't happy about. <laughs> it's from, it was from Key Porter Books. Okay. And where can we get the, uh, the, the book? I think you can get it only online now because it goes back so many years now. We're going back now. So many it's been years. quite a while. Yes. We're talking, I mean, talking, it's been, speaking of going back many years, the Norm Zimmerman just made a comment that he's been a CJD listener for the past 60 years. Aha, uh -huh, there you go. So he's known all the voices as well. I bet he goes back to, let's see, um, Melanie King, yes, George yeah. Balkin, you know, um, you had Jack Finnegan, Rick Lechner, let's not Ford forget Sinclair. It. Tommy Schnurmacher. Oh, Tommy Schnurmacher. He's still around. But, he, but he's, he's not active in radio anymore. No, no. He was, his parents used to live up the street from me. Really? That's pretty... Small world. I lived in the West End for a while. I remember Tommy. He started off on uh, CFCF 12, Pulse News. That's, that's, that's a while back. Very small. Yeah. But you know what? That's about Montreal. We have a lot of good people in Montreal. It's, it's uh, you know, it's a shame sometimes when you see, you know, they, they shuffle the panel, as they say, and we lose a lot of good people. Uh, and, and they go outside of Montreal, which is a shame because Montreal has developed so many talented people. It would be, it would be great to keep them all here. Sorry, I like to keep the talent here. <laughs> Lisa, there's this particular gentleman who actually marked you in a certain way. He told you that even though the microphones are off, yes. you know, I still got to be careful because something might happen. Who was that gentleman? Tom Armour. News anchor. JD News anchor. Tom Armour was the gentleman of a gentleman. He walked very straight, very with a purposeful stride. Um, how he's always had a nice, quick smile. And I go, I walk in and I'm young and I'm bubbly and I'm bouncing off the walls <laughs> as if I've had too much caffeine, like a tennis ball, you know? And, and I'm chattering away. And I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, like this. Tom, <laughs> Tom opens the door to go into the studio. He says, when we, when we cross over this doorway, don't talk loud because the microphone could always be filtering even though it's turned off and i always learned that lesson from tom but you know how many people got into trouble with that eh? oh <laughs> you know how many people have blown their nose for five minutes on the air with the microphone on <laughs> some people even got a little bit <laughs> adventurous with their noses actually uh, yes yeah 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 and this this one fellow got into real trouble was it a zoom meeting or something he thought the camera was off this happened maybe six months ago 
and he thought the camera was off and he found the, the lady particularly attractive and he was doing something that he was not supposed to be doing, he Oops. ended up getting into trouble. Yeah, I don't doubt it. Yeah. You have to be very careful now when you're live. Hey, look, we're, all, we're doing a live show now. Uh, you know, if my cat comes in and decides to jump, yeah, that's live. You can't take that away. The cat jumps up. Whoop, 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 there you go. It's, it's, okay. it's been there and done that. So you, you have to be very careful what you do. It's the same thing. You know, when you're, when you're working on a customer's car, People have a tendency to talk to themselves, right? So if you start swearing at the engine and calling that car a piece of crap, and the person <laughs> happens to walk up behind you, you feel about that big afterward. Classless, <laughs> uneducated, wow. and trash. So always speak politely. You know, some just because of a camera or a microphone, just be polite. It doesn't hurt and it's not doesn't cost anything. What blew me away, and I, and I thought this was a joke, but it's true. I saw this with my own eyes. People name their cars. Yes. Why? <laughs> I met a lady who called her white car Casper. Yeah. I, I've met cars that uh, my father calls his Bimmer Bimsky. <laughs> And, it, and it's feminine for him. It's my, my, she's, she's a good car. Why is it always a she? I mean, cars give you a problem. They should be a he. Hang on, hang on a sec. Uh, <laughs> Lisa, maybe the French, the French know something we don't know. Une auto, yeah, une maybe. automobile, une voiture. But, yeah, but you know what? If, I always tell people, don't call it a girl because if it gives you problems, it's got to be a guy. No comment. <laughs> Lisa, your closing comments. The show is coming to an end. Oh my God, this is this is crazy. Hey, are you going to come back to our show one time? Yeah, we'll see that. That shouldn't be a problem. It, it, we'll get more people to, to you know get on the social media and uh, maybe ask a couple of car questions or two, or tune into CJ80 Car Show and call me then. But um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, I, one of my the things I enjoy most is talking cars. Uh, it's my favorite subject. And when I help save, you know, someone a few bucks, I'm even more ecstatic because I'm kind of frugal. I, I don't like to spend a lot of money on the car, but I put the money where it belongs in good tires. That's one place I will not scrimp out. Even if I have to save my paycheck for a couple of weeks and not drive a car, that's what I would tell people to do. <laughs> you put good tires on your car. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. We just have time for your closing comments. What's the advice you have for anybody, girl, male, whoever, who wants to go into the car repair business? Is there like a, uh, a high demand in the field right now? Skills trades are in such a high demand. If you look at construction, electricity, automobile mechanics, we are in such a, a shortage of skilled labor. Um, it's, it's a fantastic trade. It's absolutely a fantastic trade. I love being a mechanic. I can't imagine doing anything other than this job. When I was in the shop, I loved being in the shop. And what's interesting is that you can't get bored in this job because every year they give us 200 new makes, models, and transmission configurations that you got to learn all over again. And you're going to school. Every, every couple of months, you go for an update of training on this or that. There's a new tool. This is a great business to be in. You can do it honestly and make a good living from it. And if you don't, you get into this business, apply yourself, get into a, a shop, get your experience in. Once you get a mechanics license, if you don't want to stay in the car business, you can springboard into another industry with your automobile mechanics card. So I would encourage young people to get into the skills trades because that's where we have a shortage of work. And I'm telling you right now, if I put out there that I was looking for a job in a garage tomorrow morning, I probably have 50 offers and not because I'm Lisa Christensen, but because I'm a second class mechanic looking for work. Wow. That's amazing. And Lisa, your show is going to be airing this upcoming Saturday at 10 AM on CJD 800 AM new stock radio in Montreal. You betcha. Do I sound like a radio announcer to you? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I practiced that about a thousand times, <laughs> but that is a compliment. Lisa, thank you so much for being on our show. You're going to stay uh, for our meet and greet at, um, when we close the show. We're going to have our party at the end of the show with the producer and the techie. Virtual party, let's go. Okay, so stand by, Lisa. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for tuning in to what was an absolutely fantastic show. Lisa Christensen just blew us away with her knowledge. She's a, 
a walking encyclopedia. She's got such passion for her trade, and she's also a fantastic radio announcer. Just letting you know, folks, that this upcoming Wednesday, we urge you to tune in to Noon Hour Out of the Box. It's going to be airing on this particular Facebook page on the Bobby Short Shorts and Esther's Breeze YouTube channels. And that's going to be this Wednesday at noon. And the topic is going to be toxic relationships. Also, this upcoming Thursday, Esther is back with her show, Esther's Breeze. And you can join her at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on the same channels I mentioned. And her host is uh, her host, no, her guest is going to be writer producer Stephen J. Rubin from Los Angeles, California. Stay tuned. Next week we have another fantastic show when we're going to be hosting Mr. Rick Bowman from the heavy metal band Martyr, all the way from the Netherlands. Well, everybody, thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. God bless. Hi there. I'm Lisa Christian.